Welcome to Riceville Beach. Come in the house. Good morning, beautiful people of Wrightsville Church. We're so glad that you're here with us today. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. I want to invite you to think for a moment about last summer and previous summers, if you've been here during the summertime, when we've had that uh, wonderful uh, aroma of the bacon and sausage and all of the things that are cooking up in the fellowship hall by our United Methodist men at this time of the year. And we can't be here to do that uh, this year. But what we can do is invite you to take pictures of yourself at home with uh, the breakfast you are fixing and uh, post those pictures on social media, Facebook or whatever, and with the hashtag of WUMC Summer Scramble, and then a dollar will be donated for each picture to um, Mother Hubbard's Cupboard. So we hope that you will do that and join in the fun. Our second announcement has to do with Bishop Yambasu, who was killed in a car accident earlier this week. Um, as you know, he is part of the uh, Sierra Leone and Rotafunk and so forth. And if you'd like to make a special uh, contribution in his name as a memorial uh, to go to Missions of Hope uh, Mission Project, we invite you to do so. And then finally, um, during August, our theme is invitation. And so I want to invite you today at the end of this service to share this worship service with a friend of yours and invite them to join us um, on watching our service as well. Thank you. And now, will you pass the peace of Christ and let us join in worship? Study war no more, I ain't gonna study war no more. I 
Will you pray with me? Holy and loving God, take us deeper into your presence this morning. We gather remotely as your Hebrew children did so many years ago. Yet we know that even in distance you are with us. You have bound us together in your love and mercy. You link us as brothers and sisters through the saving work of Jesus. And so, we come to worship you as your grace washes over us. Amen. I invite you now to join with us as we sing I've Got Peace Like a River with the words printed on your screen. foundations it can never be moved you covered it with the watery depths as with a garment the waters stood above the mountains but at your rebuke the waters fled at the sound of your thunder they took to flight they flowed over the mountains they went down into the valleys to the place you assigned for them you set a boundary they cannot cross never again will they cover the earth he makes springs pour waters into the ravines it flows between the mountains. They give water to all the beasts of the field. The wild donkeys quench their thirst. The birds of the sky nest by the waters. They sing among the branches. He waters the mountains from his upper chambers. The land is satisfied by the fruit of his work. He makes grass grow for the cattle and plants for people to cultivate, bringing forth food from the earth. Wine that gladdens human hearts, oil to make their faces shine, and bread that sustains their hearts. The trees of the Lord are well watered. The cedars of Lebanon he planted. I will sing to the Lord all my life. I will sing praise to my God as long as I live. 
May my meditation be pleasing to him as I rejoice in the Lord. But may sinners vanish from the earth and the wicked be no more. Praise the Lord, my soul. Praise the Lord. The word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Hey, we're so excited this morning to be doing a, a baptism down by the river, outside. And so today's baptism is for Liam Mountford, who is the son of Amanda and Kenny Mountford. And we're really excited. They've got their grandparents are, are off the screen, but they're here to join us as well. And um, of course, as always, you have a part to play back home. So there will be words on the screen that will show your responses for the baptism. Brothers and sisters in Christ, through the sacrament of baptism, we are initiated into Christ's holy church. We are incorporated into God's mighty acts of salvation and given new birth through water and the Spirit. All this is God's gift offered to us without price. And I present William Harrelson Mountford for Christian baptism. And so, Kenny and Amanda, on behalf of the whole church, I ask you, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness reject the evil powers of this world and repent of your sin? If so, your answer is, we do. We do. We do. do you accept the freedom and power that God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? Do you? We do. Do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in His grace, and promise to serve Him as your Lord in union with the church, which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races? Do you? And will you nurture this child in Christ's holy church, that by your teaching and example, he may be guided to accept God's grace for himself, to profess his faith openly, and to lead a Christian life. Will you? We will. Do you, as Christ's body, the church, reaffirm both your rejection of sin and your commitment to Christ? If so, your answer is, we do. We do. Will you nurture one another in the Christian faith and life and include this child now before you in your care? With God's help, we will proclaim the good news and live according to the example of Christ. We will surround this child with a community of love and forgiveness that he may grow in his service to others. We will pray for him that he may be a true disciple who walks in the way that leads to life. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Eternal Father, when nothing existed but chaos, you swept across the dark waters and brought forth light. In the days of Noah, you saved those on the ark through water. And after the flood, you set in the clouds a rainbow. When you saw your people as slaves in Egypt, you led them to freedom through the sea. Their children you brought through the Jordan to the land which you promised. Sing to the Lord all the earth, tell of God's mercy each day. In the fullness of time you sent Jesus nurtured in the water of a womb. He was baptized by John and anointed by your spirit. He called his disciples to share in the baptism of his death and resurrection and to make disciples of all nations. Declare his works to the nations, his glory among all the people. Pour out your Holy Spirit to bless this gift of water and he who receives it to wash away his sin and clothe him in righteousness throughout his life, that dying and being raised with Christ, he may share in his final victory. I'll praise to you, eternal Father, through your Son, Jesus Christ, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns forever. Amen. If you want to bring Liam over here. William Harrelson, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Where you are at home, I invite you to lift your hand toward the television as we declare God's praise and promise for Liam. William Harrelson, may the Holy Spirit work within you, that being born through water and the Spirit, you may be a true disciple that lives with Jesus Christ forever. Amen. It is now our joy to welcome our new brother in Christ. If you'll follow along on the screen, 
through baptism, you are incorporated by the Holy Spirit into God's new creation and made to share in Christ's royal priesthood. We are all one in Christ Jesus. With joy and thanksgiving, we welcome you as a member of the family of Christ. Let's all pray for Liam. Almighty and everlasting God, we thank you for your child, Liam, and the family that you have given the responsibility of raising him. Most holy God, I pray your grace upon the Mountford family and upon Liam's life. Not only do we ask that you would keep him healthy and happy, but especially faithful and close to you. May we as a church do our part as the family does their part, and we know that God, that you will do your part to love this child forever. May your grace continue to flow to him and through him as he shares that grace with the world. In Jesus' name, amen. Welcome to Children's Sermon. I am Pastor Christina and this is my helper. His name is Finn and um, I think he's gonna help me tell the story of Noah's Ark. But I'm wondering, do you know the story of Noah and the giant boat he built? That's right, Noah was just a regular man he was out just living his life, do, 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 And then one day, God told him, you need to build a huge boat. I'm not talking a kayak. I'm not talking a canoe. I'm not even talking a yacht. A boat that's maybe as big as our church. A boat that's maybe as big as your school. A huge boat. And then God told Noah, I want you to take two of every animal on here, on the boat. Can you imagine what it smelled like? Can you imagine trying to wrangle up two kitty cats on this boat, two dogs, two horses, two duck-billed platypuses, two mosquitoes, two boa constrictors, two of everything. And so Noah, decided to build the boat. Pastor Doug's gonna tell the story later on in his message, but I want you to imagine if it rained for not one day, not two days, not three days, but 40 days and 40 nights. That's, all, that's over a month. Am I doing my math right? 30, 31 days in a month? Yeah. 40 days is more than that, and 40 nights. And all the water rose up, and it covered the whole earth. It's kind of scary to think about. If we think about a hurricane or something like that, I'm scared during that. But can you imagine all the water covering the whole earth? But Noah and Noah's family and all the animals were safe there in that ark, the big, boat, kind of like a houseboat. It's like a zoo boat that they built. Well, after all the water receded and after everything um, was drying out, God sent something to make a promise that God would never flood the earth again. And something that I see, I saw last week almost every day I was on vacation and I saw it over and over and over again. And I'm wondering if you have seen it too. In fact, some people from our church helped me out and sent me some pictures of this special sign. There was something that God showed Noah that still reminds us that God has promised to be with us. 
and that God has promised that no matter what happens, God is there and that God promised not to destroy the earth again. Do you know what it is? Yep, that is right. It is a rainbow. And so every time you see a rainbow, maybe this week or next week, or maybe if you're coloring a rainbow, you can think about God's promise. With coronavirus, it feels like, we may feel like we're stuck there in a, in a big old boat with a bunch of smelly animals. But every time you see a rainbow, and maybe even if you color a rainbow, can you remember this story? That God rescued Noah, that God rescued those animals, that God has promised never to destroy the earth again in a flood and that God has good things in store for you. Do you wanna pray with me? Maybe you can repeat after me and Finn might, might pray with us too. Let's pray. Dear God, when the world feels scary, when the waters rise, when you ask us to do something that seems too hard, help us to say yes like Noah did. Show us your rainbow and remind us that you have good things in store for us. Amen. All right, thank you all. I hope that you have an awesome day. I miss you so much. Look for those rainbows. In the highways, in the hedges, in the Good morning. For the past 37 years, I've been in this church building just about every week. But this is my first time here since February. It looks different. All the pews are empty, but I know where you sit. So when we get back together, I'll be looking forward to seeing you sitting in your seat. I think the minister who baptized me evidently did a very good job because since that moment, I've been Christian. Frank and I have four children, six grandchildren, and all of them are Christians. So we've been blessed in that way. I knew all the facts. I had read the Bible, attended Sunday school, went to Bible studies, but I didn't realize that there was more 
to being Christian than what I was experiencing. One day, I was driving down the street and I passed a pear tree, perfectly symmetrical, filled with white blossoms that were just glowing. I thought, I've got to go back and see that. So I turned around and went back and parked and just sat there enjoying that vision. I said, Lord, your creative genius is just incredible. How do you think up all these things to create? And in the silence of my car, I heard God say, thank you for noticing. I said, am I talking to myself? Did I really hear that? Are you really speaking? And God said, yes, I'm here, and I am speaking. And I said, why didn't we do this sooner? Why have you waited so long to speak to me? And God said, because you weren't ready. Your heart was in the wrong place. Your priorities, you were materialistic. But now your heart is open to accept. I was afraid to move. I was afraid it would stop. And I said, can we talk a lot? And he said, anytime you'll listen, I'll talk. It was not an audible voice, but it was straight into my mind. My car was filled with the presence of God. The air was different. I knew he was there. We talked on and on, and I said, this is not me talking to myself, is it? And God said, no, I'm here. I said, in the future, can we keep talking a lot? And God said, absolutely. I sat there for a long time, and it took about a week after I went home for my heart to convince my mind that that really happened. But the proof was the change in my life. First of all, I looked at people differently. People that I had looked at and thought, there's no way I could be friends with you. All of a sudden, I found myself reaching out to these people, making friends, and loving every minute of it. In fact, I found that I loved everybody, regardless of how different we were. The world looked different. I loved every tree, flower, animal, color. It was just an eye-opening experience. The Bible, I read the Bible, and I saw things that I had never seen before. I learned new facts, and I could hardly wait to get to my Sunday school class to share it with them. On the Emmaus Walk weekend, we sing a song, and the name is The Christ in Me, sees the Christ in you. And that was happening to me. Everybody I saw, I looked at differently because I knew Christ was in them. God and I talked all the time. No matter where I went, I could share things with him, and it was wonderful. I started using my abilities to serve him. And all of a sudden, I didn't care about the things that had been so important to me in the past. I realized that my Christianity had grown to a higher level. And I was living life the way I knew God had intended. I am so full of joy and peace. And I know that it was that encounter with God 
that put me on this path. If you have met God personally, you understand. And if you haven't met him personally, if I knew all the languages in the world, I wouldn't have enough words to tell you what it feels like. It is the change in life that everybody strives for and doesn't quite know where to find it. After that, my life changed. Everything I did, I felt better about doing it and serving. I'm trying to live my life now the way I think God wants me to. And believe me, it's the only way to really live. Praise God. As we go together in prayer, um, we want to, of course, remember the family and, and friends of Bishop Yambasu, and we want to remember the family and friends of all of those who have been suffering in this pandemic, and also to lift up time in the prayer for you to name those on your mind and in your heart. Let us go to God in prayer. God of Noah, God of Abraham, Redeemer and Sovereign, we truly are all in this boat together. Your children call out to you. We need your assurance to be our anchor as our lives seem tossed to and fro. We need your guidance to be our guiding star as we try to find our way. We need your healing in our hearts and minds and bodies. Especially, we pray for these we name right now. Grant us reminders of your hand at work, Lord. Help us remain steady and faithful, preserved by your mercy and providential care. Fill us with your peace as we pray the prayer Jesus first taught us, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Water with a two-by-four. There was 
We're continuing our series on water and the word, and so today we're at the Johnny Mercer Pier. We're going to be doing the story of Noah's Ark, a very familiar story. I'm only going to be reading a few verses, but it's actually four chapters long if you want to look in the Bible. It's near the very beginning, beginning in Genesis chapter 6, going through chapter 9. And so I pick up in chapter 6, verse 11. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight, and the earth was filled with violence. And God saw that the earth was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted its ways upon the earth. And God said to Noah, I've determined to make an end of all flesh, for the earth is filled with violence because of them. Now I'm going to destroy them along with the earth. Make yourself an ark of cypress wood. Make rooms in the ark and cover it inside and out with pitch. This is how you're to make it. The length of the ark, 300 cubits. Its width, 50 cubits and its height 30 cubits. Make a roof for the ark and finish it to a cubit above and put the door of the ark, excuse me, in its side. Make it with lower, second, and third decks. For my part, I'm going to bring a flood of waters on the earth to destroy from under heaven all flesh in which is the breath of life. Everything that is on the earth shall die. But I will establish my covenant with you and you shall come into the ark, you, your sons, your wife, and your sons' wives with you. And of every living thing, of all flesh, you shall bring two of every kind into the ark. To keep them alive with you, they shall be male and female. Of the birds according to their kinds, and of the animals according to their kinds. Of every creeping thing of the ground according to its kind, two of every kind shall come into you to keep them alive. Also take with you every kind of food that is eaten, and store it up, and it shall serve as food for you and for them. Noah did this. He did all that God commanded him. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, we give you thanks for this word and for this old, old story that still reaches us and teaches us today. Lord, may we be inspired that as we go through the floods of life, we might know that you will preserve us and protect us. In Jesus' name, amen. We heard from the great theologian and church member Peggy Eford just a few minutes ago. She sends out an inspirational word to her Sunday school class every single morning by email. A few weeks ago, she sent out a list of lessons that she had run across that can be learned by paying attention to the story of Noah's Ark. Here are just some of the lessons that can be learned from this story. Number one, don't miss the boat. Number two, Remember, we're all in the same boat. Number three, plan ahead. Remember, it wasn't raining when Noah built the ark. Four, stay fit. Because when you get really old, Noah was 600, God might ask you to do something really big. Number five, for safety's sake, travel in pairs. Six, don't listen to critics who are making fun of you if you're doing what God asked you to do and you'll love number seven. Number seven, no matter the storm, when you're with God, there's always a rainbow waiting. I think just about everyone knows the story of Noah's Ark. You don't have to be Christian or Jewish to be familiar with this story. It's just ingrained in society. In fact, most people learn it at a very young age. Uh, in fact, just for fun, I did a Google search for Noah's Ark Bible story and I got 48 million results. That's a lot. I, I then, again, just for fun, typed in Noah's Ark Kids Room Decor, and I got 424 million results, almost nine times as many. It seems sweet, this old man taking his family and a pair of animals from all of creation and protecting them from the floodwaters outside the boat. But it was probably very frightening to watch it rain for 40 days and 40 nights and see everybody and everything get washed away by the floods. Noah's family and the animals on board lived on that ark for more than a year until the waters finally receded. I'm sure they knew that God would take care of them, but at the same time they had to wonder, when is this thing going to come to an end? Will we ever see dry land again? When are things going to get back to normal? As we continue our series on water and the Word, I 
wondered if we might be able to learn from Noah how to build a boat for ourselves that will float us through the floods of time. That's the question I want to ask to you today. There are some things that this Old Testament hero did that I think you and I can do well in our time. First of all, remember that Noah walked with God. Verse 9, Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time, and he walked with God. Now that'd be a great epitaph, wouldn't it? He walked with God. There's a terrible old joke, I mean terrible old joke, about an atheist jogger who found himself at the pearly gates upon his death, and he asked St. Peter, how do I get into this place? And St. Peter replied, well, if you can name the name of God's son, I'll let you in. The jogger said, could it be Andy? Why would you say Andy, said St. Peter. Oh, I don't know, but every time I seem to be jogging by the neighborhood church, I hear them singing, and he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own. I know, it's, it's such a groaner. I, I feel bad for even telling that joke. Except Noah walked with God and he talked with God and he knew that he was God's own. When you walk with somebody, you get to know the person. Joys are doubled, sorrows are shared. It's been said that people who live together for a long time begin to look alike. My wife, of course, is hoping that's not true. I do know that they think alike. I know they can predict each other's behavior without saying a word, and they can read each other's mind without even entering a conversation. It comes through walking with one another. In fact, I had a buddy that I used to go jogging with every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday when I lived in Durham. We got so familiar with each other that we could tell each other's stories. The key to a healthy spiritual life is to live in such a way that you only want to be where God is. When you develop this kind of relationship with God, you discover that there's never a burden that He doesn't carry, never a sorrow that He doesn't share. Whether the days are sunny or dreary, God will always be there. Noah walked with God. When everybody else was walking alone, when everyone else was chasing their own dreams, when everybody else was following their own desires and doing their own thing, Noah walked with God. Lee Strobel opens his book, The Case for Faith, by describing an interview he had with Charles Templeton. You may not know Charles Templeton, but just after World War II, Billy Graham and Charles Templeton started traveling the world together and preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And many people actually believe that Templeton was the better preacher of the two. But then Templeton began to doubt his faith. He distanced himself from Billy Graham. He distanced himself from God. He became an agnostic, and he wrote a book entitled Farewell to God, My Reasons for Rejecting the Christian Faith. Strobel says, as I sat in his penthouse listening to him lift up arguments against God, I said to him, Mr. Templeton, is there anything you miss about your faith? The 83-year-old, Alzheimer-stricken Charles Templeton replied with a tear in his eye, I miss my friendship with Jesus Christ. Noah walked with God, and you can too. Don't let the cares of this world and the pressures of this day, the doubts of your faith, or the success of the hour keep you from that intimate daily relationship with your Lord. Noah walked with God. Noah was also willing to follow instructions. Verses 14 to 16 tell us that God said, So make yourself an ark of cypress wood. Make rooms in it. Coat it with pitch inside and out. And this is how you're to build it. The ark is to be 450 feet high, 75 feet, excuse me, 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, and 45 feet high. Make a roof for it and finish the ark within 18 inches of the top. Put a door on the side of the ark and make lower, middle, and upper decks. Isn't it interesting how detailed this building plan is in the Bible? Have you any feel for the size of the ship we just described? Well, it's about one and a half times the length of a football field and four stories high. So, a little bit shorter than the battleship North Carolina, 
but way bigger than anything that I've ever seen out here on the intercoastal waterway. In fact, with three decks, it would have had over 100,000 square feet of floor space. Can you imagine building this thing by hand? With all that hammering, could you fathom living next door to this guy? What would you even say when you go get a building permit? Never mind. The biggest worry had to be, would it float? Verse 22 says, Noah did everything just as God commanded. Following instructions has honestly never been one of my strong suits. I'd much rather do it myself than to follow somebody else's instructions. In fact, when our kids were little, we bought a pretty nice swing set from Lowe's and with them, um, it came with instructions and shall I say, some assembly required. Some of you have been there, right? But with my father's help, I thought this would be a really fun project for us to work on together. So in typical fashion, we immediately tore open the box, set aside the instructions, and proceeded to put the thing together. Six hours later, as darkness and exhaustion was falling upon us, we still had way too many pieces. I had no idea where they went. And my kids are coming up to me and saying, Daddy, Daddy, can we get on the swing set yet? No. More often than not, I've ignored God's plan and tried to piece my life together on my own. That's my true confession. Far too slowly, I am learning that all I really need to do is follow. Just follow. God's blueprints for life have always been clearly drawn. Dare I build my life by them, even though they might seem inconvenient, even though sometimes they seem impossible. The key to Noah's fate was that he was willing to follow instructions. Understand that our world needs great leaders, absolutely. But let me tell you, as a Christian, we also need to be great followers. Followers of the way. Noah knew how to follow instructions. But there's something else about our Old Testament hero. He persevered and he endured the floods for more than a year. Noah's Ark was certainly no pleasure cruise. It was a floating zoo. Now, I don't know what you do with this story, but sometimes I get to asking myself some questions. Like, did the animals fight like cats and dogs? Did the donkeys bray all day and the coyotes howl all night? Did these eight relatives really get along together on that Ark every day for a year, or did they fight like, you know, some families do? Imagine the work involved. I mean, who cleaned up after the elephants? Who milked the cows? Who fed the chickens day after day after day? Were some of the animals already multiplying on the ark? Could anybody have stood the stink inside this place? Not to mention the pressure that if you lost an animal, you just lost an entire species. Let's face it, life is messy. Every parent knows that when they change a diaper. When families fight, spouses flee, and children suffer. Life is messy. When evil comes and the innocent cry out for justice, life is messy. When viruses strike and hope fails and despair dawns, life gets messy. What I need to tell you today from this ancient story is that when life gets messy, don't abandon the ship. There's a flood out there. The Jewish author Eli Vassell tells the parable about a man on a boat. The man is not alone, although he acts as if he is. And one night, without warning, the man decides to cut a hole under his seat. Now other people on the boat are totally alarmed. What on earth are you doing? You're gonna destroy us all. The man replied, what I'm doing is none of your business. I paid my fare, this is my seat, and I can do with it as I please. Now leave me alone. Eli Vassell concludes his parable with this comment. What a fanatic will not accept, both you and I can't forget. It's that we're all in the same boat. As long as we're in the same boat, our survival depends upon our cooperation, our consideration, our compassion, 
and our community. Noah walked with God. Noah knew how to follow instructions and Noah was willing to endure the floods. And now there's one more lesson from this old, old story. Noah celebrated the rainbow. The rain stops, the skies clear, the floods rescind, and after one year and ten days, Noah flings open the door of the ark and he steps back on dry earth. In our imagination, we'd have him stepping out that door on a velvet carpet of green grass and vegetation waiting for the harvest. In reality, he probably stepped out of the ark onto a barren landscape with bloated corpses of people and animals and debris just everywhere. I can't imagine the mess that Noah and his family saw after the floods rescinded. But it's in the middle of that mess that Noah builds an altar and he worships God celebrating the fact that he and his family are alive and that they made it through the floods. By the grace of God and the righteousness of one man, humanity is redeemed for all time. Never underestimate the power of one faithful person. Benoa Overstreet was a poet and outspoken lecturer in defense of mental health, adult education, and civil liberties. She once wrote, you say the little efforts that I make will do no good. They never will prevail. To tip the hovering scale, where injustice hangs in the balance. I don't think I ever thought they would, but I'm prejudiced beyond debate. In favor of my right to choose which side shall find the stubborn ounces of my weight. One man saved humanity. The Lord, smelling the sweet aroma of Noah's act of worship, says, Never again will life be cut off by a flood. I set my rainbow in the sky as a sign of my covenant between me and the earth. No wonder Longfellow wrote, My heart leaps when I behold a rainbow in the sky. Doesn't that happen to all of us? When I was in college, I spent my summers working for the High Point City Schools doing landscape maintenance. But on occasion, they would pull me off the landscaping crew to do some other odd jobs instead. One day it was raining, so I knew I wouldn't be sent out to the landscape crew. Instead, I was told to grab one of the old dump trucks on site and pull it into the school supply warehouse. I did as I was told. I grabbed the dump truck that I was most used to, a 1968 Chevy with a nearly impossible stick shift a long bed in the back with wooden bed rails and no tailgate. I, I think we've got a picture of one, um, except mine was painted yellow and the bed rails on the side of the bed were a little bit higher than the one that's in this picture. It was great for hauling pine bark or dirt or shrubs that needed to be planted. But that's not what it's going to be used for on this day. Instead, inside the building, some of the other workers loaded up the back of this truck with boxes and boxes and boxes of regular white paper to be sent to one of the local schools to get ready for the new school year. I don't know how many boxes were back there. I don't know, maybe, maybe a couple of hundred. I don't know, but it was a lot. Now remember, on this day, it's raining and there's no top to this dump truck. So they get one of those big blue tarps and they tie it down real tight to keep the boxes dry while I drive them across town. There were several flaws in this plan. The first was thinking that all the paper was going to stay dry underneath that big blue tarp. The second was taking the most inexperienced driver on the lot and telling him he needed to drive the big load all the way across town while keeping the paper dry. So I take off very carefully from the warehouse. I drive out of the gate, I slowly go down a little ramp, and then I try to turn left onto the main road. And when I did, all that paper shifted to the other side. 
It broke through the wooden rails, fell to the ground, and made the biggest mess. In fact, some of the boxes even came open, and paper is being strewn all over the road. Now, it wasn't a very busy street, thankfully, but that's not the point. I had broken the truck, I had destroyed the cargo, and now I had to clean it all up in the rain. I knew this was going to be an expensive mistake, and honestly, I just wanted to cry. Fortunately, because I'd just left the warehouse, some of the workers saw what happened and they came out and helped me clean it all up. After we cleaned it up and got the truck back on the lot, my supervisor said to me, you got to go tell the foreman what happened. I know. So I went over to the foreman, who I didn't know well, and I said, look, if you want to fire me, I'll understand. But I was taking a load of paper to one of the schools when I took the turn too sharply, and well, the paper shifted, the bed rail broke, and the paper ended up all over the street. Most of it's totally ruined. I'm sorry. Here are the keys to the truck. He handed the keys back to me, and he said, take the truck over to Bill, he'll fix the truck. It's not supposed to rain the rest of the day. I want you to get back with your landscape crew and do whatever your supervisor tells you to do. Okay. And when I turned around, sure enough, the rain started to let up. A little bit of sun came through the sky and there was a rainbow in the clouds over downtown High Point. I'll never forget it as long as I live. Every time I'm tempted to bury my face in my hands, I remember that rainbow. Every time I have blown it yet again and I start feeling sorry for myself, I remember that rainbow. Every time I feel like what I've done is completely unforgivable and I should just walk away, I remember that rainbow. God of the rainbow, God of the cross, God of the empty grave. How does the creature say grace? How does the creature say thanks? O oh Lord my God, may we be as faithful and as thankful as Noah was. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, you invite us to walk with you. And you protect us by giving us instructions. Lord, give us the strength to persevere the floods that surround us. And when it's all over, Help us to celebrate the rainbow. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I now invite you to sing along with the next hymn. The words will be on the screen. It's Standing on the Promises of God.
I've talked to many of you lately and you feel like you're in a flood up to here. We all kind of sense some sort of crisis. We're all dealing with the COVID crisis and some of you are dealing with even more personal crises. Remember to walk with God. Remember to follow His instructions. Yes, it won't be easy. We will be called to persevere, but God will lead us through it. And I pray that when we get to the other side, we might celebrate the rainbow and give God the thanks and praise that is so richly deserved. Go forth in peace and know that God is with you. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Amen. Since he came to me, I'm singing such a melody as ringing.